Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, whenever you happen to be watching this service right now. Uh, I've heard so many stories from different people about uh, how they've been watching these worship services. Uh, a lot of people say uh, they've been watching uh, in their PJs, drinking their coffee in the morning. Other people have said, we watched the service out on our back patio or our deck. And one person even said they watched while they were uh, uh, cooking dinner in the evening. They had, it, they had it on their computer in the kitchen. So a lot of people are watching this service in a lot of different ways. And uh, we're just glad that you're able to, to uh, be with us and that we can reach out to you in this way. We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, we, we do know that the state has... Uh, has uh, extended its shutdown order uh, for, or its stay-at-home order through the month of May. We don't know, the, certain things are going to open up in May, a few more things. We don't know what those are yet. We haven't seen a list of that. But we can be pretty sure that they're, they're not going to want churches to be meeting in the month of May. So this may be going on for another month or so. And we'll keep you updated and we'll continue to do this as as long as we need to before we can come back together in worship. And after, actually, after we come back together, um, we're still probably going to be posting uh, uh, our worship services online um, yeah, so that people who aren't able to be here uh, or who are, who are concerned about the virus because of health reasons, um, that they can still watch it from home. So, so we'll just kind of continue to go as we're going for now, and we'll keep you updated on that. We have some birthdays and anniversaries for this coming week. Um, uh, first of all, Hannah Muleschlegel is, uh, has a birthday on Tuesday, and that's April 28th, so happy birthday, Hannah. Sarah Scruggs has a birthday on Wednesday, April 29th, so happy birthday, Sarah. And then we have two birthdays on Friday, which is May 1st. Uh, one of those is Pat Polson. So Pat's having a birthday this week. Merle just had his birthday a couple weeks ago. Audra Miller also has a birthday this coming Friday. So happy birthday to all of those folks. Um, some anniversaries. Uh, David and Emily Olson have an anniversary on Monday, April 27th. Dave and Gail Little have an anniversary on Wednesday, April 29th. And uh, our own son, uh, Nathan, Nathan Shields, he and his fiance Camille, uh, they were supposed to get married uh, today. We're taping this on Saturday, and today was their wedding day. That has been postponed. We're going to do the ceremony and everything. They were coming to Illinois. We were going to do it uh, in, in our home church. Uh, they're coming to do that in September, but they wanted to get married anyway, and so uh, they have an appointment with the health department or with the uh, 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 county clerk out there in Los Angeles. They have an appointment to, to go in on Friday, and they're going to get uh, uh, married in a civil ceremony this Friday, May 1st, and then we'll do the church ceremony in September. So uh, congratulations to Nathan and Camille this coming week as well. Um, we have a number of prayer requests. Uh, we've got several that we have been uh, continuing to lift up. I did want to mention that John Purvis is now home. So uh, John Purvis is at home, and we want to wish God's blessings with him. Um, we have a couple of new ones on the list. I'm going to be reading all these, of course, uh, during the prayer time, but there are two new ones I wanted to lift out. First of all, we had been, we had been praying for Diane Wampler's daughter, Cindy Strader, and then uh, uh, this week Diane Wampler was uh, hospitalized briefly. Uh, she is home, though, and doing better, and so our thoughts and prayers are with Diane, so we wanted to add her to the list. And then also um, Doris Blythe, who is Val Bly's mother. She is in uh, Perry Hospital right now. She is on a ventilator. Um, they've been doing tests. They don't know if it's the virus or not. She's had other underlying health problems. And, and uh, so um, our, our prayers go out to uh, Doris Blythe and her family, to Val. Um, yeah, she's very concerned about her mother right now. So we want to keep her in our prayers. So those are a couple that we're adding to the list. And I'll be praying through that list later on. We are ready to begin our worship. And we're going to begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that we are blessed to be able to come together in this way. We pray for the day when we will be able to come together as a congregation. On this day, uh, we ask that you would um, uh, be with all of our families in our homes uh, who are dealing with this 
this shutdown in so many different ways, but we want you to bless them, lift them up, strengthen them in body and in spirit, uh, and, and keep them uh, hopeful and, and keep them joyful during the midst of this time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our worship continues now with the confession and forgiveness. And you can follow along on your screens at home. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Pray together with me. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray together now the prayer of the day. O God, your Son makes himself known to all his disciples in the breaking of the bread. Open the eyes of our faith that we may see him in his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We're now going to move on to our scripture readings. Our first reading is from the book of Acts, the second chapter beginning at verse 14, and then it picks up again at verse 36. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. So the people heard this and they were, um, and suddenly they, they, they realized what had happened, what had been done to Jesus and how unfair it was. And so the people there said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Talk about church growth. That's pretty amazing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson today is the text of my sermon. I'm continuing my sermon series on the book of 1 Peter. And uh, this is 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Peter writes, Likewise, wives, be subject to your husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, 
but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which, is God, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, <clears throat> that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is heard according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. This is the Gospel reading for the third Sunday of the Easter season. From Luke chapter 24, that very day, two of them, two followers of Jesus, were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Emmaus is a uh, uh, just a small town at that, uh, at that time was very tiny, and it was to the west of Jerusalem a little bit. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a, mighty pro who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of us, those who, some of those who were with us went to the tomb, and they found it just as the women said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And when he did that, their eyes were opened, and now they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while, we, while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We're going to continue now with our children's message.
and I see that all the kids are already here. They're really fast, but I know there's one of you at home, Peter Benucci, who would have beat them down here because he's always the first one down. Peter always gets here first. He runs pretty fast. Well, good to see all of you today, and I've got something that I want to show you. It's a picture. Do you see that picture? I'm going to show it to you at home, too. What is it in this picture? What do you see? I hope you can see it. I think you can see it on the camera. Yeah, I, I heard somebody. Who was it that said that? I heard somebody say soccer ball. That's what it is. Was it Caden, did you say that? Caden, you need to send me a picture or, a, or drawing of some kind. You haven't sent me one yet. Just send it with your grandpa. Have him drop it off. Yeah, there's a, this is a soccer ball, and I'm showing you a soccer ball because I want to tell you a soccer story. Now, this happened... Well, many years ago, it would have been 1973, and I was just starting out, I was in seventh grade, just starting out at a new school, and it's always hard to start at a new school anyway, but uh, I started at this school, and the teacher that I had was also the coach of the soccer team. They had a soccer team at that school. Now, I had never played soccer before, but uh, I had played other sports, so I was, I, I, I was pretty good at sports, but soccer was something new, but the, the, the teacher, the coach, he asked me he said, why don't you come out for the soccer team? And so I went out for the soccer team. Well, uh, that first week, I, I practiced a couple times and was kind of getting the hang of it. And he said, I'll tell you what, until you kind of get used to how, how a soccer game is played, I'm going to have you play goalie. Now, that's uh, you know, pretty basic. You stop the ball from going in the goal. And so in that very first game that I played, he had the, the two of us, uh, uh, me and another guy, kind of switching in and out in the goal. Well, I happened to be playing at the time, right near the end of the game. The game was almost over, and the score was tied 2-2, two to two, and here I am, goalie. And guess what happened? I heard a whistle blow, and there was a penalty on one of our players. He had touched the ball with his arm, and he was in what they call the penalty box. And if you know about soccer, that means he's going to get, someone's going to get a penalty kick. So here I was now, uh, the other team was going to get a penalty kick, and I was going to be, it was going to be one-on-one, -on -one, just me and the other one. Now, um, the coach had always told me, he said, if there's a penalty kick, you kind of have to try to guess. You can't cover the whole goal. You kind of got to guess which way he might kick it. So I was guessing he was going to go to the right, and sure enough, he kicked it toward the right. And I was moving toward the right, and I'm thinking, I got this, I got this, I got this, and I felt it tip off my fingers, and it trickled just across the goal line and we had lost the game. And I felt horrible, I felt terrible, because I was new there, I wanted the kids to like me, and now I felt like I'd let them down. I thought all these kids, these new kids, are gonna hate me because I lost the game. And I just felt just so horrible. And as I was just sitting there in the grass by the goal, feeling terrible, all of a sudden, I saw people conferring over on the sideline there was someone that was keeping the time clock. It was one of the moms, and she had gotten so caught up in the middle, uh, in all the action, all that stuff, that she had not been paying attention to the clock, and she called the coaches over and said, I think the game ran out about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> and so that, was, that happened before the penalty was called, so the referee just said, well, then uh, the penalty uh, didn't count. Uh, the last goal didn't count. It ended up in a 2-2 tie. And when I heard that, when the coach came over and said, uh, the last goal didn't count, I went from feeling so low to suddenly feeling so high. It just happened just like that. Now, the reason that I tell you that story is because something very similar happens in one of our Bible stories for today. The people, uh, two of the followers of Jesus are walking down a road and they are feeling so sad because Jesus had just died on the cross and they were as low, as sad as they could be. And then they met someone on the road and we know that it was Jesus, but he kept them from recognizing him. They couldn't recognize him. And he began to talk to them about, don't you realize that this was the way it was supposed to happen? that Jesus was supposed to die on the cross, and then he was supposed to rise again from the dead. That's the plan. That's the way it was supposed to happen. And then they said, why don't you come and have supper with us? And, and this stranger sat down and had supper with them, and then he picked up the bread and he broke the bread, and as soon as he broke the bread, he was revealed to them. They, they now could see that it was Jesus. 
And their hearts went from being so low because they thought Jesus was dead to suddenly being so high because they knew that Jesus was alive. And, and then Jesus left them, and they said something. I've got a Bible verse that I want to show you. This is what they said. It's from Luke chapter 24, verse 32. They, they looked at each other and said, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? That's Luke 24, 32. Now, I see I'm missing a word. There should be another he over here. They said, as soon as we were talking with Jesus, our hearts were burning within us. We started feeling lifted up. They were blessed by that, and we are blessed by that as well. We are blessed to know that Jesus did not stay in the grave. He died on the cross, but on the third day, on Easter Sunday, he rose again. And that's a wonderful thing. Now, I have a couple of, uh, couple of uh, things I want to show you. And then uh, we'll move on. But uh, I got a picture this week from Emerson. Emerson sent me a picture, and this is a cross with flowers, Easter lilies around it. It's very colorful, and the cross says, Jesus loves me. Doesn't that just lift your spirits? Just like the, the men on the road to Emmaus had their spirits lifted. And, uh, and he writes on the back, he says, I miss being at church to hear you tell what Je about Jesus, and I miss do you doing the kids' sermon. So... So Emerson, I miss you too, and I look forward to seeing you again. And then I got this wonderful letter. This comes from Jed Adamow, and I'm going to read the letter to you. He says, Dear Pastor Bill, I have been really mad about all that is happening. I'm with you. I'm with you, Jed. I have been mad at the politicians and people who make the rules. <laughs> he said, I will sometimes say that that, that that is not right, and they make no sense. He said, but your sermon helped me so much. That was when I was talking about how we are subject to the governing authorities. He said, I would like for the church to be together, but in the Bible, Paul said, the church is not the building, but the people. And that's absolutely right. You are the church no matter where you are right now. I think those words we can use, we can use at this time, is what he says. And then he says... God has a reason for this time, and no one knows what it is for. A lot of wisdom in that statement. He said, I think it is special that through this time we can still worship and praise God. We have a special connection, not through family, but through Jesus Christ. Yours truly, Jed Adamow. Isn't that a great letter? So he, he, they brought that by. We got that in the church this week. And you can keep on sending me those, uh, those notes, those letters, those drawings. I hope you will. And uh, Caden, you have to send me one this week, okay? And we are ready to pray now, and then we're going we're gonna to move on. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that when Jesus rose from the dead, it changed his followers from being so low and so sad to being so high and so joyful. And we pray now that in the midst of these difficult times that we are going through, that you can bring joy into our hearts, that you can lift us up, lift up our homes and our families with the joy that they felt on that day on the road to Emmaus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. And now uh, you can look at your screens at home, and Lynn is going to play a couple of verses of one of our Easter hymns.
My sermon this morning is from the second reading in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Uh, This is part 5 in this series that I started before Easter. I took a break for a while, and now I'm picking it up again. This is part 5 in the series uh, on the book of 1 Peter. And the, the message today, I've given the title, Three Principles of Christian Marriage. Three Principles of Christian Marriage. And I want to uh, just, read, just read a couple verses for you again from the text. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I remember my good old Uncle Ole telling a story about something that happened many years ago when he and Aunt Lena were just newlyweds. One night, uh, Ole was at the Sons of Norway Lodge for a meeting, and he was having a conversation with his good buddy Sven, and Sven said, Hey, Ole, how's the, how's the marriage, married life treating you? And Oli said, well, it's pretty good, except for one thing. And Sven said, what's that? And Oli said, well, it's just that Lena is such a terrible housekeeper. I come home from work at night, and the house is a mess, and the su- supper isn't even started, and I'm kind of getting fed up about it. Sven said, Oli, you need to do what I did when Helga and I were first married. And Oli said, what's that? Sven said, well, I came home one night, and the house was a mess. And, and so I says to Helga, I says, I am the king of this castle. And when I come home at night, I expect the house to be spick and span, and I expect the dinner to be on the table, and I expect you to be waiting there for me with my slippers. Oli said, and how did that work? Sven Sven said, well, the first night when I came home, I, I didn't see anything. And the second night, I didn't see anything. But on the third night, when I came home, the house was clean, the dinner was ready, and Helga was waiting there with with, with the slippers. And Oli said, I I think i got to try that. Well, a few months later, Oli ran into Sven again, and Sven said, he said, by the way, Oli, did you ever try my advice? And Oli said, yeah, yeah, I did. Sven said, did it work? And Oli said, well, it was just like you said it would be. I came home one night, and I told Lena, I am the king of this castle. When I come home, I expect the house to be clean, the dinner to be on the table, and you to be waiting there with my slippers. Sven said, and then what happened? Oli said, it was the same way as it was for you. On the first night, I came home, and I didn't see anything. On the second night, I came home, and I still didn't see anything. But on the third night, when I came home, the swelling had gone down just enough so I could see a little bit out of my left eye. (laughs) Not a good move on Oli's part, trying to push Lena around. Lena is a tough old girl. (laughs) And that was a completely wrong way for Oli to be treating her. That's not what God wants to see in a Christian home. God does not want a husband to be disrespecting his wife and ordering her around. Nor does he want a wife to be disrespecting her husband and ordering him around. God wants Christian marriage to be a partnership where both husband and wife love and respect each other, as Luther says in his explanation to the Sixth Commandment. God wants Christian marriage to be a loving, harmonious relationship which is a shining example of the love of Christ for us in a dark and sinful world. And that is what Peter is talking about in our lesson for today from 1 Peter chapter 3. He's going to give us several principles about what it means to be a Christian in a marriage. And I could have picked out probably six or seven or eight different things in this text to talk about, but I've decided to narrow it down to just three things. That's why the title of my sermon is Three Principles of Christian Marriage. Three Principles of Christian Marriage. But if you're not married, I don't want you to tune out, because even though these principles are being discussed in the context of marriage, they're actually principles which can apply to relationships between men and women in all aspects of life, and really relationships between all people wherever we we are in life. Now, before I talk about the three principles in this text, there's one big issue that I have to talk about first. And that issue is the cultural context in which these words were written. 
We all believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. It is God's Word. But we also know that God gave us His Word through human beings. We call this the doctrine of inspiration. Peter himself describes the process in his second letter. In 2 Peter 1.21 he says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the Bible is the Word of God, but it often reflects the cultural situation that the author was living in when he was writing his particular part of the Bible. And one of the important tasks that I have as a pastor when I am teaching in a Bible study or preaching uh, a sermon is that I have to do my homework. I have to be able to interpret the text so that I can separate the eternal truths of God from those things which are just part of the culture of that time period. And in this case, we are dealing with a cultural context where women were second-class citizens. Doesn't mean it was right, it just was the way it was in that day. Women did not have very many rights. And so there are going to be some things that Peter says in this text that reflect that, which were part of the culture of marriage in the first century A.D., but which are not part of the culture of marriage in, in, in our day in this place. And so I need to say that right up front because you're going to see it right away in the very first verse of the text. Peter is going to talk about marriage in a way that we would not talk about it today. He's just speaking from his culture, and what we need to do is find the eternal truth of God's word, what I like to call the nugget in the midst of those words that come from Peter's context. So let's take a look at principle number one, which is this. Husbands and wives should be respectful to each other. Husbands and wives should be respectful to each other. That's the principle. So let's see what the text says in verses 1 and 2. Peter writes, Likewise, wives, be subject to your husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Now that phrase, be subject to your husbands, is a reflection of the cultural situation in that day. We would not use the, that phrase today. We would not talk about women being subject to their husbands because we do not live in a culture where husbands own their wives. Nor do we as Christians believe that they should. This is Peter using the language of that day. But what is the lesson that he is trying to teach here? What is the eternal truth here? Peter is speaking to a very specific situation in these verses. You see, in the early church, there were many people, many women who came to believe in Jesus, but their husbands were not believers. And what Peter was saying here was that uh, to the women, he says, you will not win over your husband for Christ by arguing with him, by criticizing him, or by humiliating him. But you will win him over by your respectful and pure conduct. And I believe that what is true for those women in that situation is also true for both men and women in marriage relationships today. The nugget of truth is that we don't win arguments in marriage. By being, we don't do that, we don't win arguments by being the best debater or by throwing out the most witty insults. <laughs> in fact, that's the way you destroy a marriage. I remember many years ago, I knew a couple who always seemed to be arguing about something, and they, and they were both at fault, no doubt about it. But the wife was the one who always seemed to be willing to go low, and she would always go for the insult. She would always try to embarrass or humili humiliate her husband in front of other people. And every time that I was around them, I used to just cringe when she would make some insulting comment about him. And a few years later, to no one's surprise, he ended up having an affair with a woman from his work. And when his wife found out, she left him. Now, of course, he was wrong. There was no excuse for, for what he did having an affair. But there was an explanation. <laughs> I think he simply got tired of being beaten down by the one who was supposed to be his biggest supporter in this world. And I've seen it happen the, the other way around as well. I've seen women who were put down by their husbands so often that they, they either ended up uh, in another person's arms or they just left the marriage. When, a, when Aretha Franklin sang that song, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, she knew what she was talking about. <laughs> the first principle of a Christian marriage that Peter talks about in this text is that husbands and wives should be respectful of each other. And then the second principle that Peter talks about here 
is that husbands and wives should consider inner beauty to be more important than outer beauty. Here's how he says it in verses 3 and 4. He says, Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing that you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Now again, Peter is directing these comments at wives because he is talking uh, to them in this section. But I'm going to apply it to both men and women in just a moment. First, though, I need to address the question, is Peter saying that women should not care at all about their personal appearance? Of course not. That's not what he's saying. What he is saying is that they should care more about their inner beauty than they do about their outer beauty. And here's where I'm going to turn it back toward the men. Because in order for women to care more about inner beauty, men have to care more about inner beauty. I remember many years ago, a good friend of mine and his fiancée were hanging out at my parents' house. Now, this is before Lisa and I were married, so I was still living at home with my parents. And uh, we were at the house, and we had some uh, snacks set out, and I told them to help themselves, and his fiancée picked up something small, just a cookie or something, and he jumped all over her. He said, you can't eat that. You'll get fat. I don't want a fat wife. <laughs> right in front of all us, he said that. And I saw two things in that moment. In that moment, I saw a young woman's spirit get crushed. And in that moment, I saw the shallowness of my friend in a way that I had never seen it before. I tried to talk to him about it a little later when it was just the two of us, and he pretty much told me it was none of my business. <laughs> and that marriage didn't last long. Neither did our friendship. <laughs> People, we live in a culture that is obsessed with outward beauty. And in that way, we are a lot like the culture that Peter was living in. The first century Greco-Roman world was also obsessed with outward beauty. You know, we have a lot of uh, uh, wives and girlfriends who are trying to look like they did when they were 19 years old. And we also have a lot of husbands and boyfriends who expect their wives and girlfriends to look like they did when they were 19. But that is not the way it should be in a Christian marriage. In a Christian marriage, we walk through all of the stages of life with a person. We walk through all of the physical changes that take place as we age. And we look at our spouse and we still see the beautiful person that began that journey with us. That's a Christian marriage. Now that doesn't mean that we just let ourselves go physically. I still want to look my best for my wife. I'm not going to stop shaving or bathing or anything like that. Although if this quarantine goes on much longer, all bets are off. <laughs> but as Christians, we need to have a different set of priorities than what we see in the culture around us. And that's what Peter was saying in that first century Greco-Roman world. You need to have a different set of priorities than the culture around you. In a Christian marriage, Husbands and wives should consider inner beauty to be more important than outer beauty. That's principle number two in this text. And then principle number three is this. Husbands and wives should be understanding toward each other. Husbands and wives should be understanding toward each other. This one is addressed specifically to the men in verse 7. Peter says this. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, I know that you all heard that phrase, the weaker vessel, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment because it's important and we need to understand what Peter is saying there. But first, let me address the question of why Peter is directing these words at the men in particular. And the answer to that question has to do with the cultural context again. Remember, in that world, the husband was the one with all of the power, he didn't have to be understanding if he didn't want to be because no one had a right to tell him what he could or couldn't do with his property. But Peter is saying that Christian husbands should be different. Just because they had a legal right in that day to abuse their wives verbally and physically, Peter is saying it does not mean you have a moral right to do so. God condemns verbal and physical abuse by both men and women, but men had to be reminded of it more specifically. And that's for two reasons. One is the one I've already mentioned, that men in that culture could legally do whatever they wanted to their wives. 
So Peter had to remind them that there are some things the law allows and God condemns it. But the second reason that Peter directs these comments to men in particular is because of that phrase, the weaker vessel. The word vessel refers to a clay pot or a vase. It means the outer shell that carries the inner self. In other words, Peter is not saying that women are weaker emotionally or that women are weaker spiritually. He's not making a statement about their inner strength here. What Peter is saying is that women in general are physically weaker than men, which means that most men who are in a relationship with a woman are going to be physically stronger than their wife or girlfriend. It's not true in every case, but it's true in most cases. And what do we know about this sinful world that we live in? We know that in this world, those who are physically stronger tend to dominate those who are physically weaker. That's the dirty, rotten truth about human sin. And I've seen it a number of times over the years in marriage counseling. I remember once I was counseling a couple who were wanting to get married. So it was pre-marriage counseling. And in the course of the discussion, I asked a, a question that I always ask. I started with the woman. I asked, is there anything about your relationship right now that worries you, that concerns you? I wanted her to say that in front of him so that he could hear it, and then I was going to ask him the same question. And she said, there is one thing. She, she went on to describe how her fiancé always made her call him when she was leaving work. She had to call him from the landline at her work, um, and then she had to call him again when she got home from the landline in her apartment. And uh, uh, I don't even know if she had a cell phone. A lot of people didn't have cell phones in those days. Um, but everybody had landlines still in those days. And he had caller ID on his phone. And so he wanted to know exactly where she was at all times. And, and she had to tell him if she was like going to stop at Walmart on the way home. So uh, he would say, well, that should take you about so many minutes. And so she was concerned about that, that he wanted to track everywhere that she was going to be. And um, as she was telling me this, uh, the bells, the alarm bells started going off in my head. This guy was a control freak. And control freaks are often abusers as well. So I tried to probe that a little bit more, but, but soon he was just kind of glaring at her and she just shut down. We didn't get very much farther with that. So the next day I called her at work and I, I said, when you get a break, give me a call back. And, and so she did. So you got a break. She called back. And I said, I, I have concerns from our, from our counseling session last night, specific, specifically about your fiancé's controlling behavior. And I asked her if he had ever been physically abusive of her. And she went silent. And that answered my question. <laughs> Finally, after a period of silence, she said, what do you think I should do? And I said, I think you should run away from him as fast as you can. <laughs> it's literally what I said. And to my surprise, that's exactly what she did. She, she broke off the relationship, and a couple of years later, she met this great guy. I did their wedding. They're still together today. They've got a great family. No woman should put up with physical abuse. God doesn't put up with it. Peter says, Husbands should show honor to the weaker vessel so that your prayers may not be hindered. He says that if you are abusing your wife, God is not going to listen to your prayers. <laughs> And I would say that, th that the same thing goes for those who, are, who abuse children. Those who are abusing the vulnerable people in their lives, they need to stop what they are doing. They need to repent of their sin. They need to get whatever help they need to get because you don't want God closing his ears to you. So how should husbands and wives deal with each other? They should treat each other with kindness and understanding, says Peter. If there's anything I know about marriage, it's that husbands and wives are going to get upset with each other from time to time. We're going to say things that hurt each other. We're going to do things that annoy each other. And a lot of the time, it's simply going to happen because one or both of them was having a bad day. It often happens just for a reason as simple as that. And that's when we have to be understanding. We have to have thick skin so that every little thing that is said or done doesn't, doesn't penetrate us. <laughs> and hurt us and we have to learn how to apologize and we have to learn how to forgive Peter says that husbands and wives should be understanding 
toward each other. So those are the three principles of Christian marriage that, that I have drawn out of this text from, from 1 Peter chapter 3. Husbands and wives should love and respect each other. Husbands and wives should consider inner beauty to be more important than outer beauty. Then husbands and wives should be understanding towards each other. And then Peter wraps up this whole section with a wonderful statement in verses 8 and 9. I'll read it for you. He says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. I love that. That is what a good marriage should be. Have unity of mind, have the same values, the same goals, do things together, be a true partnership. Have sympathy, feel each other's pain, know when the other is hurting. Have brotherly love, that's the Greek word philos, it means friendship love. Part of a good marriage is that you're also good friends, you enjoy spending time together. Have a tender heart, don't harden your hearts to each other as the years go by, but stay soft and tender and thoughtful. Do not repay evil for evil. There is no place for revenge in a Christian marriage. Do not keep score of old hurts. Forgive and move on. And then lastly, he says, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. Bless your spouse. Be a blessing to her. Be a blessing to him. If I were to die before my wife, I think that the one thing I would most want her to say about me would be, I was blessed to have him in my life. And I'll tell you people, if you ever have a relationship like that, whether in a marriage or in a friendship, if both people in that relationship can truthfully say from the heart, that person was a blessing to me, I don't think there's anything better than that in this life. And if you are both believers and you meet up again in heaven, it doesn't get any better than that in eternity. May God bless you in all of your relationships. And if you are married, may your marriage be an example. May it be a blessing in a world that desperately needs more hope and more joy and more faithfulness and more love. Amen and amen. We're going to confess our faith together now in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We're going to enjoy a couple verses now of another Easter hymn. Lynn's going to play for us this joyful Easter tide.
Let us bow our heads together in prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you on this day and we pray for our families. We pray especially for the marriages which are at the center of those families. We pray that you would teach uh, husbands and wives, parents and children to be respectful to each other, to be tender-hearted to each other, to be understanding toward each other. We pray that we might be able to look beyond the outer shell and see the inner beauty in each person and that that inner beauty might be the thing that we care about most, the thing that we love the most. And we pray, Father, that uh, um, not only will we be blessings to each other in, in our families, but that our families, uh, because they are in Christ, will be a blessing to the world. Help us to, be, uh, to, to evangelize and speak to the world about the love of Christ simply because um, we have that love in our hearts and it is radiating from us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we continue in the midst of this, uh, this uh, quarantine, this, this COVID-19 shutdown. We pray that you might be with all of the people who are, who are uh, working uh, on the front lines, who are medical personnel, who are emergency responders. We pray that you would bless them, be with them, uh, and, and we thank you so much that, that they are out there um, fighting this disease for us. We pray that you might be with all workers who are, who are continuing to go to work, that you might protect them and watch over them um, and keep them safe as they go to and from work. We pray for those who, who are out of work or who have had their hours reduced and, and now this is becoming a great financial struggle for them. We ask that you would bless them and show us ways that we can reach out to them. We pray that you would give them um, some kind of help uh, that they can make it through this time and get back to the day when, when they can be working again. And we pray for uh, all of the people who are in homes together. We know that uh, as we are, are, are put together in our homes and we are stressed out by the situation, that that can cause things to flare up. And we pray, Father, that you would calm hearts, give us the peace that passes all understanding in, in, our, in our relationships. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father, we lift up all of these people by name uh, that, we want to, that we're thinking about during this time. We, we pray for John Purvis, for Lucille Munson, for Doris Blythe, for Ron Wall, for Chris Jasker, for Jackie Pilcher's daughter, Kim, for Char Morger's daughter, Kathy, for Diane Wampler's daughter, Cindy Strader, and also for Diane Wampler herself, who was briefly hospitalized this week. For Susan Loritzen's cousin's daughter, Amber, who has had cor coronavirus. For the Femrights' son, Mike, who is a first responder. For Tom Anderson's sister, Pat. For Mary Hull. For Tom and Joe Kloster's granddaughter, Shante, who is in the military and is right now in Iraq. For Liz Bird's younger brother. For April Buchanan. For Merle Polson. For Ashley Bushy's father, Earl Kessel. For Tommy Larson, who was in the hospital and had a surgical procedure this week. For Lori Anderson. And for Carol, the sister of Judy Mugerdichin, who is also suffering from COVID-19. Father, we lift up all of these people and all of the others that we name in our hearts, and we commend them to you and ask for your blessing and strength to be with them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now we pray together the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. And as we go out, we're going to hear Lynn play her postlude.